Okay. We are live now. We can go in. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the sixth sixth episode of uh, Young Surgeons Forum. Uh, our talk for today is going to be focused on uh, revision e replacements. And uh, um, uh, for this talk today, we have with us Mr. Um, Jangir Malachmiwala um, from UK. Uh, so it's uh, so kind of you to uh, come on to the session um, for for this talk. Uh, he's got a large knee-based practice, which is basically north of London. Um, he does a lot of revision joint replacements, revision knee replacements. Um, the world famous Halo knee course uh, is one where uh, he's one of the main speakers, uh, and he has uh, also uh, got. Uh, I mean the 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 knee job that is there with him, uh, most of the trainees north of London or um, from Cambridge are very, very keen on coming for a knee job uh, with him. So, uh, sir, um, we'd like you to take on from here and uh, if you can share your screen with us. Yep. Can you see that there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you see the screen and can you see me as well, Jay? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Jay and Anup, and all the organizers from Water TV, Dr. Ashok Sharma and Poonam, for the invitation. Really, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I really feel these type of small discussions, even though it is being streamed, uh, we can focus on a few group of people and it is an important topic for revisions it's not uh, it's surgery which can be done after you have to a certain degree mastered primaries so is that the correct theme jane i hope is that i can give a talk for about half an hour 35 minutes on what i feel is important both from principles and practical aspects and as you know jay you've worked with me and uh, i'm a very practical surgeon so i think i We'll try to give some points which are more, which will help all of us. Well, you're all, all of you are established surgeons, but on what I feel could help in the execution of cases. Okay, I think that's something which we can discuss. Obviously, principles and things are there, but I think with I've talked to the three uh, the surgeons and they all have done enough me. So at any stage, if you really are, I like to be quite practical of what I do, yeah, rather than uh, principles only. Is that all right from all of you? Absolutely. So going on, I thought I'll plan the talk and let's start now. So uh, into concepts of bone loss and constraint, because this is there for any revision, as you know, whatever we are tackling, it is only actually based on these two principles when we are truly operating. And there is a fundamental difference between bone loss management and constraint issues. And then I just put the concepts of total re re revisions. And then I thought I'll add on, and then everybody talks about revisions as actually doing a case which needs to be done like a full revision, most commonly being septic infection. But there are many cases where you'll be based with an unhappy knee. It could be yours, it could be your colleagues, it could be referred to you. And then do you agree it's a decision making on an unhappy knee as to whether to revise or not? Now, do you agree that may sometimes be more difficult than the true decision of a straightforward revision? So the for the conveners and the three uh, surgeons, do you agree that is also a reasonable thought process? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yes. Yeah. Because that's where you have to decide that you want to revise or not. So do you mind if I have time and if it's okay by you all, I can cover that. Yeah. But if you feel you want to do it as a separate topic, topic for the future as unhappy need, but I really feel it's linked. You know, your decision on revisions is this. Are you happy with that? Absolutely. I think that's very important. Uh, you know, uh, to know okay. once you know the problem, at least you should know whether you should go in or not. You know, is not Perfect. And then I, as you know, uh, I do the how to do knee for a primary knee for the hollow course, 
and like that uh, since then I've got a few slides of how I actually do some uh, revisions yeah? so I'll put that up if we have time so starting with uh, revisions the issue with stems right the stems are used in revision settings all the time you agree and just fundamentally yeah we need to have a tibial stem or a femoral stem whenever we use a higher constraint that we always use in a revision yeah. setting and whenever we use any augmentor sleeve so just keep that i know it's too basic but it's an important principle never to forget so whenever we are using any augment any sleeve or any higher degree of constraint we will stem either the femur or the tibia then we can decide whether we want to go uncemented short long that can be part of discussion and then if it's not a revision setting, I just like to set the ground that I use a tibial stem in a non-revision setting when I have a large defect, defect which is not large enough for an operator sleeve, and when you have poor bone quality, and even in when I'm operating on previous tibial fractures, even if it's one year down the line, just to let you all know, I do use a stem. But that's I'm veering a little bit from this topic, but I'm just saying that's when I use my stem in my non-revision setting. But we all will agree in our revision settings, we are all going to use some degree of stem. And what it does, it offloads the stress away from the damage. That, that's what it is at the basic science level. Now coming to constraint. Now constraint is the next level up. And this is, again, I know it's basic, but I think for anyone listening to the audience, whatever you are, you to know that constraint is the stability provided by the implant, irrespective of whatever is there of the soft tissue. So you decide your revision constraint, and then we go up in the degree of constraint. So when you need a higher constraint, is not for any severe deformity for bone loss and that's something which when you see a really deformed knee a revision knee a lot of varus a lot of algus ap laxity so whatever you want but provide not laxities but provided the valgus varus issues don't jump in your mind in your revision setting mind that look this patient will require a hinge you don't you need to restore the bone loss and then you go for your uh is there a, a, a Anup, is there a background noise? Can uh, everybody can everybody talk and everybody tell please? Yeah, I think it's a lot better. Yeah, sorry, I was getting a little waylaid because uh, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. Sorry, sorry. So I don't know where I stopped because I, I was very loud at my end. So Anup, what did I what, where was I? Because I really we were talking hear. about we, we were talking about uh, having a constraint only for bone loss. Yeah, And correct. we were saying that that's not the point that we are discussing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So when we have bone loss, we should not jump to higher constraint, everyone. Yeah, so I'll, I would say, first, let's get our joint light restoration correct with getting our bone loss correct with whatever we want to do with our augments, etc. Then we check our laxity. And then in a revision setting, we will use a various various constraint knee now tc3 is what i use and we can discuss later on as to what everyone's using but i use dpes it's not right or it's wrong there are fantastic systems on the market but i use a tc3 but the generic word for that is a varus valgus partially constrained knee okay so this is the workhorse of everyone's revision practice whichever brand they use and then we can talk a little bit. I don't know when any of three of you all who are presenting have a hinge which you all have put in, but hinges are not common. But when I do it, I have a very clear indication of doing it, which is a rotating hinge. So that's the background of where we are. Okay, so everybody knows this. So that's the things. And a fully constrained hinge knee is what I use. Now, again, I'm just, because it's a high level forum where everyone's doing revisions, I, there are two types of hinges. This is the highest level where you have a sleeve and then you have a hinge or there's a stand more, which I use as well, where you have no sleeve, you have stems and a hinge. So we can discuss, keep that in man and open J. If you just put a discussion as to, you know, I like your views as well as to when you'll use it. Is it cost constraints? Is it true clinical constraints? Okay, about when I use either of the two. And then moving on, just 
I know this is not a revision setting, but the sleeves, I use a lot of sleeves, which are part of our diffuse armamentarium. And that's for metavisual sleeves in the metavisual area for getting our bone loss correct here. So I have in the tibia, just to let everyone know, in my complex primaries and in any of my revision settings, for the last eight or 10 years, I've probably on the tibial side, I have not used a step or a wedge. So in other words, I've not used any augment. I've always used a sleeve. So I like your five of yours views, whether that's the way your trend is going or not. Okay, that's another point. If I'm, you can just put as a discussion as a, is that correct as to going away completely from stems? I mean, from augments on the tibial side and going to sleeves. Yeah. So now let's go on to concepts of revision needs. So let's start with the basic concept is exposure. Yeah, and I divide my knees into revision knees into can I expose the knee, then removing the implants, and then making decisions about where we are. So, so I like to start with uh, yeah where we yeah there. So in an extensile exposure, I all use the lateral most scar. That's one. If you have multiple scars, keep a five centimeter bridge between the possible, the two, and then I decide, I decide whether when I do my revision exposure, will I have to do any proximal extension or will I have to do a distal extension? And I think that's something you have to, it's difficult, but you have to make that decision early on. So don't make this decision later. So if you really feel that you need to it's a very stiff knee, you're going to struggle with the exposure, then decide early on for uh, tibial fibrosity osteotomy. But if you're not, and you have to use proximal winds, the only thing I've started using now is the rectus snip. Now, just for everyone to know, when you, I do a medial parapetella approach, so going into the quadriceps area medially, and in the traditional rectus slip or any extensile method, when you come to the, you know, the proximal bit of your tendon, then you can go, one option is to go superiorly and laterally. But my feeling with that is if you do that, then you can't extend it anymore. So I go, when, once I go medial reticular and I'm having a struggle with that exposure, I come down from medial to lateral, but down inferiorly, all right? So that's a snip and then I evert my patella. It's, I've never done a rectus uh, or a quads turn down, but if you have to, I've seen enough results in my predecessors. Paul Allen, when he used to do, he used to do a huge amount of revisions early on and quadriceps turn down can be done. You can get good results, but between the two now, I would choose very early on and do a rectus snip proximally as my most proximal work. And I would make my early decision, not on doing a rectus snip, but I'll do a tibial fibrosity osteotomy. Once again, I think this is a reasonable discussion to have because this is where you practically will be struggling, not struggling, but this is where you have to get it slick to get your knee exposed in revisions. So that's another point, uh, Anupan J, if you want to just put down as, do you all do it? You know, are there any parameters we can all agree on to say which ones? Yeah, because I'm telling you, this is what you practically want to be slick in. You're getting it open and getting on with the bony work. So what are the, I'll come to some indications later, but the basic indications would be septic loosening. Yeah, this is our commonest one. And please understand whether you live anywhere in the world, I think this is the one where you will be faced with your colleague, yours, et cetera. A septic loosening is long-term survival studies have shown, yes, there's lysis, polywear, implant fracture. Then, and these two are straightforward, all right? There's no issue. You're seeing lysis, you're seeing polywear, you're seeing implant fracture. Okay, these are true component migrations. These are true component issues. I think these are barn door and the top two, I know septic loosening we can discuss and there's huge discussion on should we revise, is it infected or not? Now that we can talk about, but the above two are the commonest ones. The ones which I find more difficult to decide on is malalignment, instability, right? And patella related issues. And these three in my mind, I put in under unhappy knees because these knees are unhappy. Either you, they are your knees which you just accept and you know they are unhappy or they come to you from someone else. 
and you know that revising them is going to be difficult because the result is different and also the decision making is difficult. So this is the one we'll talk about. And the last one is very straightforward, it's very prosthetics. Now, in septic loosening, we can talk at length, you know, the enough one day discussions, two day discussions on one stage versus two stage. In I personally, I still stick to traditional two stage. My colleague Paul Allen is truly changed completely to one stage. There's one stage in the textbooks or correctly should be done if you have a known microorganism. And there are no, I know the people who do true one stage all the time, don't worry if there's a discharge or a sinus, but potentially that's the one where maybe do it as a two stage. The next discussion we'll have which I know I've talked to one of the, my surgeon colleagues who's going to present is whether we do an articulated spacer or a cheeseburger, which is your cement here, yeah, I think. Once again, if you don't mind keeping it there, that there is a place of a cheeseburger, let's decide when and when not to use it, okay? And then if we are using an articulated spacer, should we be using a commercially available one or should we be using our own? And what I use all the time is a new femoral component and an all poly tibia. Okay. We can use other things. You can use a rotating platform, poly insert, et cetera. Once again, let's talk about it, whether we should be using that. Are they licensed to be used, not licensed to be used, et cetera. And then this is my workhorse, right? So on the left is barn door infection. This patient had a stem put on, see the cement all the way down. I put this up because it's a little more challenging than a normal one. She, the reason why the surgeon who did the primary operation put a stem, what do you think the issue was? I, I, at age 11, she had some surgery done. I think there was some issue in the proximal tibia. So I think he was worried about that and therefore he stemmed it, the cement all the way down. So definitely infected. There was no doubt from that. We talk about workup of that, but I thought that's we can keep as discussion. Is that Anubhanjay, do you think there's right to keep a discussion? Because I'm sure there may be one or two infected cases where people will say what they've done. What do you think, uh, Anubhanjay? Should I leave it for discussion yes, later? Yes. Yeah, we'll discuss that later. Sir. Yes. Yeah. So, so workup of that we'll discuss later, but let's say I worked it up and what I did was a all the femoral component with an all polytibia. And then I then don't worry about time frame, And that's the important, this thing of six weeks coming back, aspirating is six weeks, blood's fine. I believe six weeks is not the correct time to go in. The patient's just about mobilizing. Well, are the tissues ready? What's the use of going in six weeks? If you're doing what I'm doing now, just keep it longer. Let the patient just walk, get a movement. And then my workhorse of the knee is my valgus varus partial constrained knee, all right? So, and if you look all as I've, I don't know about you all, but as you all become do more and more revisions, your poly should be aiming for 10, 12.5, 15. So in other words, exactly what you use in a primary setting, those days of large polys, joint line being not correct, uh, are not uh, aim for it. I'm not saying I won't have to do it, but let's aim that our polys are always, which means how can you aim for that? That means you've distalized your femur enough and your joint line is restored from your tibia. Okay. So my workhorse is just to let everyone know, I use a MBT tray, which is a rotating platform, sleeve always on the tibia, stem. Now we can discuss short stems or long stems. Yeah. But I, I generally will use a short stem. On the femoral side will be a valgus varus constrained knee with a stem. Definite augments, most of the time, you will always, or let's say most of the time, always you'll have a distal augment. Will you have a posterior augment? I'll tell you how to use it or how to use posterior augments, but less in the size. And then I also like to, this everyone, just keep in mind where your stem goes, right? This is crucial. So let's discuss whether the lateral view post-op makes a decision which helps us in our decision-making when we do the next one as to where we put in our stem, right? So just keep that in mind. And then we go down to the concepts is, now let's decide that what are the general principles in TKR revision surgery. So that I divide the case into 
exposure, which you've discussed. Yeah. So my exposure is what I wanted to do, and I decide on extensile proximodistally. Next, I flexed up, and I want to remove the implants. Third, I do what is called intra-op judgment. Yeah, and this is decision making, which is practical. All right, you can I use all the textbooks. You can talk about larger femur, gap balancing, etc. But that will come to intra-op judgment of getting it right. And that's where we can have some discussion where hopefully I can give you some practical points. Yeah. And then you implant your chosen prosthesis. And among all of these, this is straightforward, this is straightforward, this is straightforward. The intra op judgment is probably the most difficult. So the intra op judgment is how, how do I do it? So let's let's go back and just imagine that I've done my exposure. I'm going to talk about how I do my removal of implants in my how to do section. And now I've because this is more like a generic talk about the principles. I thought I'll just tell you what I do. So when I've removed my implants, so let's say I've removed my femur, I've removed my tibia, then I use spacer blocks. Now, if I ask everyone, is spacer blocks critical? What does it tell us? All the spacer blocks tells us is three things. And I write it on the board. So I write on the board, the flexion gap equal to extension gap. So that's your one scenario. The second you write down, flexion gap greater than extension gap, put it on the board. And the third write down, flexion gap less than extension gap. Now, the last one, which is a flexion gap less than extension gap is not so critical because we all have agreed now that in modern revision surgery, we will always do our best to distalize the femur. Do you agree that most of us will be using our augment distally to get our joint line distal. Do you agree with that? That's now mainstream, correct? So we've already done that. The question is, therefore, we are left with two things on your board, which you've written. Flexion gap equal to extension gap, or is your flexion gap more than your extension? Yeah? Now, so when I put my spacer gap now, I just stick which one it is. Yeah? And most of the time, let's all hope that your flexion gap is equal to your extension gap. Yeah? So that's what you've done. Then I next work on my tibia. Now, I don't know, we can have this discussion if one or two of you can just put down who works on femur first, who works on tibia next. So I work on my tibia and I have ways of getting my tibia intra stem correct, which I'll talk about. I may do it depending on time in the how to do section a little later. But just keep that in mind. So I work on the tibia and I always use a metal sleeve and I recreate the joint line as much as I can. Now, why did I use this phrase, recreate the tibial joint line? Is that I don't know how many of you all use the Dupuis metaphysical sleeve system and how many of you all don't. But if you use metaphysical sleeves, please understand that if you have reasonable bone loss on your tibia, you potentially could have your tibial base plate not truly sitting on bone, all right? It would be higher up, yeah? You will have area of that base plate un where it's not sitting on bone. So when you start doing metaphysics, you'll see it like that, it's absolutely fine, yeah? Because fixation is not on your base plate, it's on your metaphysical sleeve. So keep, and that, but I keep the sleeve, high, I keep my base plate where the joint line should be. And then after I do that, I work on my femur. We use augments to distalize. And then I work on my femur to use my augments for filling the posterior space. Okay, so that is my rationale. So it's spacer blocks first, then work on tibia, then work on femur, distalize and posteriorize. So the intra op judgment. Now, once I've done my these steps, then I do my trial on the femur, right? So now I've put on my trial, I've taken my TC3 implant femur. I put in whichever distal augments is needed, let's say four millimeter medially, eight millimeters laterally. I put in whatever augments posteriorly, and then I put it into the femur. And then I make a judgment and see if it is rotationally. So what I do is I just check on the bone if I can do this. If there's rotationally stable, then my decision making is that I'm happy with what I have. If you're rotationally unstable, 
then I decide on a metaphyseal sleeve on my femur. Now, once again, if you don't mind, can you keep this? I'd like to hear from you whether that decision making is any other way is your own. But I know there are some surgeons who are very high metaphyseal sleeve users in India, in Mumbai, who will go for a sleeve on the femur relatively early. So should we be doing that or should we be doing what I'm doing? Yeah, I mean, it's not right or wrong. It's just good discussion. And then no large polyintrates. And then, then I make my judgment, right? And then I decide that most of the time it's a partial varitharis and I don't have to go for the higher level of the visual head. So now implantation, the metaphysical sleeve with stem, augments on the femur with stem, rotating platform, and a valgus. So that's what I use here. So I've, I've said that before. And again, this is my workhorse. So in this case, I'm just telling you again, we can discuss, so base plate, rotating platform, metaphysical sleeve, stem, short or long, open for discussion later on. Femur, once again, let's have a discussion. If it's a six or seven point, if we have time, Anupa and Jay, can you write down, should we be using a press fit, which I've done here, right? See this press fit on the lateral? Or should be using cemented stems. So let's have that discussion. And again, remember I told you, keep in mind where I've gone up here, because this I find actually surgically the most difficult to get right. You agree? I'm just showing, I don't know how I can show you on my hand, but you know, you can actually get this wrong, where you can get it here. You know, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you can be here. Your stem can look like that. Your can stem look like this. So in other words, what is the advantage of the lateral being correct? Yeah, so let's discuss that later. So now let's decide when we are going to definitely use a hinge in a revision setting. So for that, I'm very clear, and I would give you this advice, that if you see any knee replacement where you may have done an EUA, or it is very clear, there's a true instability or a laxity in the anterior posterior plane, right? AP plane. And your X-ray looks that you're seeing it with the tibial tray, you know, subluxed posteriorly. Then I would really say the decision making is easy. Please go for a hinge early on. Happy with that? Now, that's what I do for my hinge early on. But most of the time you agree the issue is always valgus varus problem, which I said, don't rush into a hinge. Please recreate your bone loss joint line and then a partial valgus varus constrained knee is the answer. However, in this case, does it, can everyone see here? Yeah. So this is a revision case. Do you agree? I don't know what implant this was. I don't even know whether it was some old fashioned hinge or not. But do you agree? Can you see that the stem breakage? Uh, Anupanji, can you can everyone think? Yes, yes, that? we can we yes. can see the theme. Yeah. So I, I realized there was stem breakage. I realized, you know, is this come does this come in the periprosthetic? It truly wasn't. I mean, this guy was in pain gradually, right? But it, aren't we in the realms of some issue of hypochondrial issue, bone loss, whatever? And see the amount of bone loss on the tibia? Just want to show you that. Now, in this one, just keep to our decision making. Our decision making is. Can we expose the knee? Now, if this guy is stiff and he was stiff for 25 years, he's not moved his knee. Don't we all agree that there's no way a rectus snip is going to help me? So therefore, early decision on a TT. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no question of not doing a tibial, tibial osteotomy on this one. Next is how are we going to flex up the knee and implant removal? Now, that you agree is going to be difficult if I want to restore bone loss on my femur, right? Yeah. So if I want to restore bone loss on the femur and take it out, I know I'm going to be on a loser. Right? So my decision making here would be very early on that A, I need a hinge, correct? I need a hinge, definitely. But the question is not a hinge because of this. I want to know that I'm going to remove all this. So this one, I will use a distal femoral replacement, DFR, right? But on my tibial side, what are my options? This was in the realms of what you can get because I was worried that is my tip. If you're completely lost and your your where your attachment of a patella tendon is gone, then you can't use anything as a proximal tibia. But in this case, we can use a sleeve. So what I did was this. Yeah? 
So sleeve, yeah, again, yeah. Place sleeve. This is I did a, a combined case with my colleague Paul Allen. A stem. We went for a longer stem. Again, we can discuss when we use longer stems. Always, I don't. I personally use short stems, and then a DFR. Right. Now, uh, Jane Wright, I got it's twenty six minutes. Can I carry on a bit more? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So. I put this in as extra articular deformities because one of the revisions I find difficult is that let's say someone's done a knee and it was a wrong indication earlier and it failed because of an extra articular deformity. Now, when you're revising, you have to decide what you want to do. You have long stems. Can they go up where they could? So, you know, these are the ones where I found. And therefore, whether you're doing a primary knee or not, I ask myself, can I correct the deformity with TKR? or I need to do an independent correction before the revision. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. So that will be your issue of in the revision more because we will be using steps. So I just put that in as that's, I would probably feel that rather than saying second revisions are more difficult, third, of course, as you go up in the revision chain is more difficult, but do we all agree this one would be the most challenging? Yeah, as to how we are going to tackle this one. So we use long leg alignment for them. Just make your own judgment again, whether it's revision or primary is, you know, if your entry point, and you're a small group, so I don't mind, I'm sorry the x-ray is not good, but you agree your entry point is crazily there. You decide what you want to do. You know, how are you going to get it right from your revision setting or your primary setting? So let's move on to true indications, yeah? So this is what I've enumerated. So you agree it'll be infection. There'll be aseptic loosening, which includes the three things I said. There'll be pure lysis, which is lysis, which is bone loss, which you see on the x-rays. There's polyethylene. Once again, I find personally, you know, when people, my registrars come and fellows come and tell me, look, this guy, I think he's got poly aware. I don't know. Sometimes it's difficult to judge that. But x-rays can be taken in degrees of different flexion. And that may, sometimes the one three months ago may show the poly is not too worn. You know, so I... I don't judge too much on one x-ray as to poly away. Implant fracture, very straightforward. So these are all component migration, component loosening, straightforward. Malalignment and instability, we'll talk about that. Very positive fractures. And then if you're doing a uni, and I think I've talked to one of the surgeons who are going to present unis, which are either infected, you revise, or if there's progressive arthritis in the other joint. And then in a uni, if there's a mobile liner, what should you do? Is there something wrong? Is it, you know, is it, if it's going on dislocating, is this is an issue with that? So these are the ones where we are left with to do a revision. So I have a how to do it as a Word document, but I thought now onwards, I'll just take a few steps of how to do it. So what I do is a WHO checklist. Uh, antibiotics should not be given on it. Samples are taken. Let's decide whether we should do it only for septic loosenings, or even with a septic loosening, should be with all antibiotics. I liked your views on that, if you don't mind, Jay Anup and others, that what do you all do in India? You know what? You know the question I'm asking is that in a septic, there's no doubt, yeah? We take all the tissues and then give the antibiotics. But if you're really doing it for a septic loosening, should I tell my anesthetist give it earlier, or should I wait till all the implants, till the specimens are taken? And I use Tunicae, of course, for all monies, including revisions. So, we have two choices now. Uh, Anup and Jay, how many minutes did I have? 40 or? Yeah, uh, I guess four or five more minutes and then we four can. Five, yeah. Think, yeah. Yeah. So in four or five minutes, I would suggest that can we talk about my steps of a knee? Because then I leave the unhappy knee for a discussion. Yeah. Because whoever mm -hmm. may have some cases. Yeah. That may be a better yeah. way of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Is that okay? Is that a. Yes. Yeah. I think that yeah. works. So I would say when I'm doing my revisions, and this is a true case again, supine position, side support at the level of the tunicae or proximal. Don't put this side support here, all right? Just put it really high. I really want my exposures to be more if I need to. Two foot supports, one for 90 degrees and one when I hyperflex to do my work. Yes, yeah? so two foot supports. I make a long line here. See the line line? It's a long line as the end of the original scar. And then I make an incision longer. Yeah, so the longer scar beyond my incision. I work like a primary knee. So just orient yourself. 
that I work with the diatomy, how many of you use knife diatomy, doesn't matter. I'm telling you again, you have to have, if you're raising flaps, which you need to, and these are skin and fat flaps, everybody's paranoid that, oh, raise flaps, the whole knee is going to fall apart. You can raise flaps, and I'm telling you, working on gutters and things are very important for exposure. But if you raise a flap, as Jay will tell you, because he's worked in hollow, it has to be done very elegantly and in one source. So I don't, there shouldn't be any hesitancy cuts. Okay, it should be one nice raising of the flap, even in a revision setting. And a revision setting, I'm telling you, it's important. Then I come down, and that's a tip. You know, when you're doing a revision, all this will be scarred. Please don't start from here and go up. Start proximally, yeah, in your thigh area. Just cut with a knife, boom, boom, come down and see the metal. Come to see the metal here, then start from here, coming down and cut here. And when I come here, the best tip I'll tell you is just remove all the tissue here. Don't go down here. In this area, start here, see metal, metal, metal. There'll be a lot of tissue here. Just remove everything here like a square and then come down and raise a nice flap, exactly like a primary. And really go around raising a flap like a primary. Now, even before you do this, I use cockers. Take two, one cocker here and one cocker here and take all the tissue which is scarred on the inner side of this layer of the reticulum. Yeah, so please do that early on. So you're going to cut open, cocker here, cocker here, remove the tissue underneath this layer. So that helps. So this then becomes what I'm holding the forcep is very mobile. Yeah, so do all these things to help. Then I remove the tissue here and then come down to my retinacle. And that's what I, so I, you agree now, I've got this is loose and done. I've gone down here and I've everted the patella. How do I evert? Work a lot around here, yeah? You have to work around here, everting here. And then next decision making, once you see this like this, you can't flex up more, you, yeah? So you're, you're having difficulty flexing up. So the best tip at this stage is remove the poly. So the next step for practical reasons is remove the poly. Now, what are the ways of removing poly? If you know the commercially available poly introducer, use it and remove it. If you can't, 20 years down the line, you don't have it. If it's a PS knee, what I do is I take a saw and just chop this off. I chop the uh, cam off. Oh. Yeah? And then I remove the plastic. If I can't remove the poly, just, just cut it. But please remove poly first. If you remove poly first, it allows further flexion. And then you can start on your work on your femur and tibia. And then next decision, should you do femur first and tibia first? It's always what I do is I like to do the tibia first. If I have good exposure, now do you agree with this one? It's an excellent exposure. Yes. So this one, I would, if I could, and I get good lateral exposure, then I like to keep the femur so it protects, you know, when I'm putting my, my retractor at the back here, I can remove the tibia first. Yeah, so that's what I do as tibia first is my choice. But if you have a lot of soft tissue here, then remove the femur first. So I use a two osteotome technique. I particularly showed you that you must need get the exposure like I've got here. Yeah, you need the exposures to work there. This is where People work here, work here, work here, and they cannot work here. Because you agree, all your soft tissues here. And that's when you less gondola loss. So see my exposure, you get that there. And get in the front, and the tibia is there. So now when you remove cement, and I'll finish in a minute, just break the cement like this. How, I don't know how many of you will do that, but I break the cement 90 degrees to the surface. So that's the cement, and I crack down, and then it breaks up. Yeah, and then I remove the base plate. Please don't, you need to hyperplex to remove the base plate and that's the exposure you need. And then I use my sleeve, which we can talk about later. Sleeve and stem, that's my default here, yeah? short stem, but a sleeve. Yeah, and then I prepare it with the correct rotation. Now, this is what I was trying to say. Should we, when we do and starting our femur, do you want to be like this or you want to be pushed up? So you decide one got an advantage and one a disadvantage. You need, by putting it back yeah, and making sure there's no play there, make sure that you fill up the back of the knee. So I think getting it back so your posterior part is filled up is the first choice. 
but don't do it in such an angle that you're coming out anteriorly or the stem is going to hit the anterior body. Then you'll get your anterior high pain, right? But between the two, try to do everything to fill up, fill up posteriorly. Yeah, that's a tip. And that's it. So that's what you want in the end. So see my distal and my posterior, and I got a 10 or 12.5 here. And that's my end result. Cement only on the tibia, like I'm doing. Everything else is metaphysical sleep. And that's my end result here. Yeah? Distalized posteriorly on the bone. See, good bone there. So I'll end there, yeah, and that's my tracking. And I'll stop there because I like to, it, it worked out well because it's 35 minutes and we can have further discussion on unhappy knees as when we go along. Yeah. That's good. Thank you, right. sir, for a succinct presentation. Um, sir, what, what if uh, we need to distalize the femur more than what the usual augments that are provided are? What do you use? Bone plugs uh, in, in a severe bone loss or would you just use a sleeve to distalize the, the, the femur log? Yeah, e excellent point. I know the, the answer to that is that when you... I, I think it's not just distalization. You... Let's say you have uh, uh, put in your knee and one decision making was that you're in so much bone loss somewhere that your posterior augment, your distal augment is not enough to rotationally control the femur, right? That, and that's that right. is my first decision making for using a metaphysical sleeve. But you've asked a very valid point that let's say we cannot distalize enough, right? Then you have two choices. One is your insert size will go, which we don't want. Or secondly, you can easily use a metaphysical sleeve where you hit upon a very good point. Again, in the metaphysical sleeve, the fixation will be on the metaphysis. So your entire body of your EC3 will be off the bone. You know, you don't have to worry about it being on the bone. That's yeah, right. yeah. So you'll see it like that. And then comes to the two choices. The implant companies will want you to use the largest augment so you're close to it. But actually, it's not doing anything. You can put cement, you don't put cement, it doesn't matter. The fixation on the metaphysical sleeve. Yeah, that's right. most of the time, I'm telling you, truly, your need of a sleeve will not be for that you cannot distalize enough, it will be for the rotational problem and practically I feel. Yeah? But your point is absolutely valid. Right. So if, I'm, if I'm getting it right, you're saying that if you're not able to distalize enough, mm -hmm. and you use a sleeve to distalize it, Correct. Then you don't really need to put any augments because you're going to be hanging in air anyway. So you're not... Exactly. Some amount you use, you use it somewhere, but yeah. some amount of it will be off the bone. So don't worry. It looks dramatically there, but that is the thing of sleeves. But again, practically how often this is done is a little lower than the one where I feel I've used a metaphysical sleeve more for the rotational where there's such bone loss somewhere, I'm not getting my control. Yeah. And in that case, then your metaphysical sleeve your augments are quite important as well because you'll be on the vicinity of the bone, but the metaphysical sleeve is giving you, aiding you the stability extra. Yeah, clear on that? But both points are right. That's right. So, uh, one, uh, when we are to use a short stems in the femur, mm -hmm. it's easier to play around, especially anteroposteriorly, as far as the femoral component goes. Maybe you can use couplers, maybe you can downsize it. Uh, with, with sleeves, you are you're basically committed to anterior posterior uh, extent of the of the femur component. Absolutely. Uh, so so in that case, would you prefer a sleeve if I'm supposed to posteriorize the femoral component, uh, which I can't with a sleeve in C2? Mm -hmm. Would you use a, a a short stem and then posteriorize it, or use a long stem with a coupler and then dial it posteriorly? Now, there are some systems where, where you're talking about the coupler and getting in posterior, there are some systems that allow that, okay? Right? Okay. Yeah. In my, in the diffuse system, there's nothing which allows you to go back on a coupler, right? Now, I would say, let's stick to our decision making also, is that the minute we went up right from the start with our drill and our, you know, reamer to get our fixation, right? You have to go with some reamer, whether you use a short stem or a long stem or a sleeve, 
Anup, that decision making I make only after I've done my reaming with for my tibial stem. Yeah, so let's accept that I do practically. You take a twelve. Start with a twelve reamer, right? Twelve, and you're yeah. going in. Then you go fourteen. You go in. You go sixteen. You go in. Correct. Happy with that, Anup? And at sixteen, uh, you get. Yeah, yeah so but you have to I make would... that decision. we need to be committed for the length first before we we put to rim and the fit yes but i commit myself not for a sleep i okay. commit myself That's first right. for the length and i would say not for a sleep in your mind don't decide on a sleeve first right decide That's on a stem right. first and That's that right. marking for most systems will be different for a normal stem and different for a sleeve you agree with that or yes 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 So Perfect. my, I don't go for the marking of the sleeve first. Yeah, and that's the easiest way to explain this to everyone. So I, in my mind, go for a marking. In my mind, thinking I'm going to use a stem, right? Not a sleeve. Right. And that right. marking tells you as to where you stop, and then you do that's all right. your work on that. But I'm telling you again, when I dream to 16 and stop considering I'm using a stem, not a sleeve, right? And at 16, right. I, I. i then take out the handle and then i check look at my hand i check whether that sleeve that handle with uh, which is now in the in the femur is even if there's slight movement you agree that sometimes you get a slight movement right you know yes yes either it'll be solid fit which is fantastic but you agree sometimes up and down there's a slight movement correct yes yes that's true so in that case put your hand on top of the rod and push it down so it a few millimeter it comes down you agree with that you know that perfect perfect yes and yes. then i shove in over that a sausage you know there's something which keeps the rod more posterior yes. in yes. the metaphyseal area right right, right. okay okay so, so i have now done my best as a surgeon and what bone loss i have to make sure that i've put that rod as back as i can you agree with i've done that That's yeah, it. I can't do any more. What God has given me for the bone, that's what I've done. But at least I've done my best. Then I carry on with my cuts and decide on distal augment and posterior augment. You agree with that, right? Yes, yes. Now right. I put in. Then I do my trial, and if that is all looking good rotationally, then I'm not doing anything else. I'm not using a sleeve. Correct. That's right. That's now right. the problem happens is now I want to use a sleeve. So then what I do. Anup, now I am committed. I can't go front and back is committed, but as back as I can. Then I re-ream again for the liner for the sleeve. So the whole process okay. starts again. No cutting corners. Yeah. I now put the marker for a sleeve, which is more in. Now that now it could stem is no longer sixteen. It could be fourteen, twelve, thirteen. Maybe I am changing. And then hmm. I commit to a sleeve, bang, bang, and put a sleeve. And then where I am is where I am. You get my point? That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So I've not committed early on. Now the third question you're asking, Anup, is now let's decide I've not used a sleeve and I was happy with my stem, right? That's right. Then the final implantation, even though all my work was done on a 75, let's say I'm using a figure, 70 centimeter uncemented stem, right? My final implantation, I can change to whatever I want, Anup. I can use 30, 60. Seventy-five, whatever I want, and that answer in the world is not there as to whether you are better with uncemented or cemented. But that decision, Anup, is only after your work is done. You shouldn't be making the decision early on. That's my best tip to understand. You know, I took a long while to understand this, so that's why I am explaining. True, true. Does it answer your question to a certain degree? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, it did. So. Um... So then we come to this topic of uh, you know how do you establish the joint line um, I- I- when we have a significant bone loss in the tibia. Uh-huh. So what are your markers that you follow on table? Now for the tibia, uh, let's decide on the tibia. Uh, there's no mark. You all you'll do is accept that you've removed your tibial tray, right? Accept right. that you've uh done your best to remove the cement with minimal bone loss correct let's accept that right now we know already do you agree that about anyone who's done that knee you're already on to 12 mm gone correct yes yeah i mean there's no question yeah the person originally must have removed 10 and you've taken another 2 3 definitely off your uh by removing bone the cement cement yeah. right 
and most revision systems will have the minimum insert of 10 millimeters correct yes. so i would say my decision therefore after is very simple i the whole the, the tibia is looking at you there's a big hole there you decide to i will talk later about get your alignment right but i put in my tibial stem i ream again and then when i use my sleeve right when i bang my first sleeve in i bang it so that it goes below the level which i'm going to cut right just a bit below mm. and that then i go up sequentially but always remain that and then cut over that now if i cut just over that i remove what 14 12 13 you know what I mean? so i will not remove it i'll bang that sleeve in just below the topmost level of the bone left for me that's the answer it's a practical answer there's no fibula there's nothing else you can decide on that right 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 so that's, right. that's what you would do and then you'll realize that most of the time you and don't hammer it so far in because then it's crazy then you're truly going lower down so just go below what your top part of left bone is for you and yeah. that's your answer for your tibia now that's the right. femur you you want me to tell you the femur or do it as a yes, yes 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 so the femur i find a little more difficult now i don't know which systems all of you use but mm -hmm. one of the things you'll find is how much of the distal femur to remove right is that our answer yeah so we right. should remove a few millimeters from the higher side correct that's what you are aiming for now when you right. put in your jig to cut the distal femur the implant companies tell you to put it at zero in the window i don't know which system you use but in my dequis system the mm -hmm. window will be zero in other words you're not cutting anything off Absolutely. my tip yeah. for that is that i find if you put that jig so far distal on the bone there's such bone loss on the femoral side that practically no pins hold anything you get my point yes yes so therefore it may be not wrong practice but it's it's correct practice practically in the window to just go two back you know just go two back so you're on good bone and then you can pin better and then remove it yeah that's it okay and then you go through whatever slots every system will tell you lateral medial is four eight whatever and then you cut that that's all you can do and what you're left with is what you're left with there is nothing more you can do honest that's, that's your right. bone given to you that's right so there was this entity of hybrid cementing i'm sure it was uh, before the the era of sleeves came in in mm -hmm. which if you have a, a, a large amount of metaphyseal defect and a good rim a contained mm -hmm. defect on the tibia use a long uncemented rod and cement the metaphysis mm -hmm. is there still role uh, especially in a in a uh, you know cash stripped population that we have uh, mm -hmm. in our in our country or uh, would you so use your... some cement Uh, yeah, so on 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 a sleeve. Yeah. So in, in other words, case. you don't have a sleeve. You're relying on a yes. stem, right? Yes. Yeah. That's right. And you're relying on cement in the metaphyseal area. That's right. Now, between that, you've jumped one stage. That could there be if there was differential loss on the one side. Let, let's say the tibial plateau medially was very you know osteolysis. Then, have you said that we cannot even use a step or a wedge, because or we can use that because suppose we can use a step and wedge right and a long right. stem that is definitely cheaper and we do it in england as well in insur insurance company yeah you, the right. step and the wedge with a stem is a cheaper construct than a metaphyseal yeah metaphyseal is expensive yeah so right. that would and then you cement without a doubt beautiful cementing on your tibial base plate yeah how much you sub inside also yeah shove something inside it doesn't matter yeah you shove as much as you can down so that i accept as a reasonable way yeah, we used to do it before the sleeves 10 years ago we did this only yeah but that's right would we do it without a step and away just relying on a base plate and cement in the metaphyseal i would say that is not going to hold in modern uh, practice you get my point that's right yeah so as far as your yeah, ratios or uh, percentage use of sleeves Mm -hmm. in revision on the mm -hmm. tibial side goes what yeah. is the ratio that you use in your practice right now in uk i'm telling you you cannot in in revision setting 100% sleeve it will be the that's smallest right. sleeve smallest sleeve and the that's right. tip is go for a smallest sleeve 
Yeah? Don't go for the bigger sleeve. The best, smallest sleeve is giving <laughs> the best fit. Just go for that. So That's my good. answer is I have not done one revision. My colleague Paul Allen has not done one revision without a sleeve on the tibial okay. side. Perfect. Okay. On the femur side, very rare. 10%, I would say, of every revision would need a sleeve. Otherwise, stem on the femur. Yeah. With so on, the femoral, on the femoral side, you mentioned that uh, if you don't get a rotatory stability on the femoral side, yeah, uh, when you're using the TC3 is when you use a sleeve. Correct. Uh, have you considered upsizing or reaming further with a longer and a thicker rod? Because in my practice, I found that also adds to significant rotational stability. So Correct. would you would that be your priority or you directly go in for a sleeve? See, the thing is that if I or I would let's work on the assumption, Anup, that you know, you and me, we are all done enough. When we decide to stop reaming on the femur, right? Let's say we stop. We yes. stopped reasonably confidently that, yes, we can go maybe more by putting much more pressure, but generally we don't want to do it. Otherwise, you would have done it right from the start. You know? Right. Uh, right. So how much I can convince myself that the 18 I can really shove in and get it, I'm worried about doing it because I felt I should have done it well where I stopped. But, you know? Yes. So how much more... I don't know whether you get that. That's one. And secondly, it's the same principle I feel Anup, of the rod moving a bit. If you really look at it, 50% of the time, that rod, however hard you rim, let's say you rim to 18, you manage the 18 instead of a 16, that rod will move because there's some movement, some are happening in the metavigilance. So this problem of the rotation is not, I think, relying on distal. I, I could try and please do it. But if that's not happening, I would move to a sleep. You know, relying on the distal fit, uh, I'm deciding on the proximal fit, yeah, because we're going up the thing. The answer, I would probably not go for that. In, yeah, but try it, but I wouldn't do it as my first step. And as regarding changing the implant size, right, three and four, very good question again, Anup. The, that I would only change if my flexion gap in my first, remember on the board I wrote down, Right, I yeah, wrote the gap more than extension. More than extension gap, yeah. Then, if I put in my, you know, when you do your, each system will have it that you can anteriorize your block. You know how much to cut, correct? That's yeah. right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. You can anteriorize or posteriorize. You know, the zero plus five minus fly, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, now, sir. if I ticked on the board, flexion gap more than extension gap, then we all agree, all five of us that we will not want to, if by choice, anteriorize, correct? Because yes. we are getting a flexion gap even more crazy, right? Yes, that's right. So in that case, that's the only time, Anu, I would use a larger size female. Right. You get my point? Right. That is only on my decision making, which is nothing to do with rotation stability, correct? Right, right. Indirectly, right. it may help, indirectly may help, but my primary decision making for upsizing is only that and not else. And then That's again, true. if you ask Anup, how often do I do that? I just put on in the zero and plus five, whatever fits best you go, because there's never going to be such a mismatch between your flexion and extension gap. And if there truly is, right, then mm -hmm. you're in the realms, in my opinion, of an anterior posterior major problem of instability rather than bone loss. You get my That's point. right. That's right. That's right. So problems of overstuffing. Uh, how often yeah. do you get patellofemoral, uh, you know, overstuffing when you are you do the knee, it, it, it's bending pretty well, but you see the anterior flange of your femur is actually off, yeah. and uh, uh, and you're stuck with the sleeve. Uh, you can't do much for the femoral component, mm -hmm. and does that actually trouble you, or trouble your patient? Yeah. So Anup, the I would say this overstuffing on the patellofemoral revision forget about yeah that won't be a clinical problem but again i know you hit a very very good point that the if your femoral flange is anteriorized more than you want right yes the question you have to ask yourself is did that happen because when you're initially putting your block on you you know we had the choice zero plus five minus five could we have gone for a minus five or plus whatever system you want, where it is gone backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah, and that's right. 
going backwards is always advantage in revision because you always want to fill up your posterior space. There's bone loss, right? That's right. That's right. So your choices were either zero, which you took and was a little wrong because now you're anterior, or mm. you felt that by going backwards you would notch, correct? Otherwise you would That's have done. Right. Mm. So if you're there again, God has given you this knee. God has given you this bone loss. You've decided that you could not posterize your block, and this anterior amount which is there is what you have done as the best surgeon in the world. There's nothing you can do. About it. You know. That's right. So this is the answer. I tell myself, this is it. I have not gone back because I would have notched. So I'm not doing it. That's right. And, oh, this, sure. yeah. and therefore, it doesn't make a difference. Not at all. I'm telling you, patients. You get your flexion extension, use a 10 or 12 or 15, forget about every all other patella problems will be sorted. How, how do you deal with the patella during a revision? So would you change the button if it is if you're doing a revision in all cases, or would you leave the button on if it looks all right? Yeah, I would say that the let's talk about infected, non infected cases. Anup and Jay and everyone, do you agree? We all will remove the button without a doubt. Is that sauce? Yes. Yes. And remove the plastic plugs. Do your best. Yeah. And when you come to re-implant, let's make that decision later on, right? When you come yes. into a, a septic loosening, then if it's a young patient who's got many years left, so you want the knee to last like a primary, and the patella button is not matching your original system, right? Then you are, have to change it. Yes. Correct? Yeah. That's if it's a young person and your patella button is matching what you're putting in now, so TCG is acting with your normal you know, patella, mm -hmm. then it's a little more difficult decision. Is that should you take it off? Yeah. Should you take it off or should you not? So my feeling is I just make a judgment as if there is no wear on that, I leave it. Right? But now we come down to when I'm re-revising, if it's an old person and it's got a different mismatch, I did one yesterday, it's 29 years, I just left it. You have to balance it. Because if you remove your patella, either you left him with a thin patella or you can have a little risk of fracture. And they will have problems with that. So I warn patients getting up a sitting position and stair climbing. And if I'm doing it for infection, uh, just, just can you wait just a minute, please? Yeah, just one minute. Yeah. If you're doing it for infection, then leave it as a as a without the button. Yeah, just one minute. I'll be with you in just one minute, guys. Right? Right. Yeah, is that all right? Just a minute. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm back. Right. Uh, should we should we move on to the cases? Yeah, but Anup and Jay, Anup, the fantastic. I mean, uh, the question you're asking is truly exactly relevant to what I think of all the time, both of you. Yeah, thanks for that. Right, thank you. So we'll start off with the presentations. Uh, we'll have Dr. Animesh present his case first. Yeah. Shall I start, please? Screen yeah, sharing. you can start presenting your case. Yeah. Okay, uh, so today I'm going to present a case which is not a revision. <coughs> However, it, it is a case with a severe virus deformity with a bone loss, mm -hmm. compelling me to go ahead with uh, TC3 implant, use of mm -hmm. the TC3 implant and stem. Yeah. So uh, a brief description about the case. This is a 66-year-old female patient with a high BMI of 32. 
प्री ऑप रेंज ऑफ मूवमेंट वॉज अराउंड फिफ्टीन टू सेवेंटी डिग्री देर वॉज ग्रॉस एंशियल लैक्सिटी एंड द मीडियल स्ट्रक्चर वेर रियली टाइट पेशेंट वॉज मोबिलाइजिंग प्री ऑपरेटिवली विथ वॉकर so here is the x-ray uh, i'm talking about the left knee uh, as we see there is a severe yeah. bone loss and varus deformity uh, on the tibial side correct <clears throat> and there are a lot of osteophytes as well posterior osteophytes and we can see that dedicated uh, mm. left knee x-ray for the patient mm -hmm. uh, here i would like to show a video as well mm -hmm. of the patient clinical examination sure Right. So it is a correctable varus deformity depicting that there is an intact MCL with significant medial bone loss. That's where we are now. Yeah, correct, Anu. Yeah, carry on. Uh, yeah, yeah, carry on. Go ahead. Yeah, no, Anu, okay. you're right. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's why I, okay. I agree with you, Anu. Anu. so this was the clinical and this is the final picture post operative where mm -hmm. i had put the long stem uh, mm -hmm. uh, differing from uh, mr mahalakshmi wala because he prefers to use a short stem i use a long stem because i i felt like uh, distributing the load all along the tibia and mm -hmm. uh, i didn't use a wedge i built the bone loss using the distal femoral uh, i mean it was a Very bone nice. graft yeah yeah i agree I'm which sure. i used the distal femoral uh, bone yeah. graft and yeah. fixed it with a screw correct i cemented the uh, the tbl base plate not the whole stem correct and uh, i had to use tc3 because uh, because of the lcl laxity and Uh, while doing the soft tissue release, I, I had a tough time. Uh, the MCL was very tight. I had to do pie crusting to release it and to do the coronal balancing. Mm -hmm. Even after doing a lot of pie crusting and opening medially, I was not able to balance the coronal plane. So finally, okay. I decided to go with a TC3 implant. Oh, However, one thing which obviously I wanted, I want the opinion of the house and including Mr. Mahalakshmi Wala that. using tc3 and femur without stem how how safe i am there sure sure uh because this was a primary and femur was there wasn't any bone loss mm -hmm. so i i chose not to put a stem there on the femur even though the tc3 implant sure, was there sure sure no. so good point to discuss good point to discuss very good and uh, just to complete uh, my presentation i i did some Uh, literature such about bo bone graft mm -hmm. and uh, the, the one of the good paper which i came through was of uh, uh, dor and ranawat yeah they yeah. they had this 34 case series where they had used uh, autograft structural autograft and they have shown good result there yeah yeah and uh, to complete the discussion which i thought uh, mr malakshmi wala i to discuss about the anderson orthopedic research institute classification about different kind of bone loss for the viewer to understand I mean, yeah absolutely. in the revision setting that's why i just quoted here very good because uh, you know, we we need to understand what kind of bone loss we are dealing with and there is a flow chart which will come in subsequent slide which will give us a guide of how and what to do this is a pictorial or diagrammatic representation of the ori classification Absolutely. and this is a flow chart which uh, can give us an idea about uh, how and 
how to proceed in situations of revision need where we have bold losses. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so, good. This is it from my side. Yeah. Right. I will. So there are there are three points that uh, possibly we need to discuss. One is um, one is uh, whether whether uh, a stem is indicated. Yes. If yes, uh, would you in this situation use uh, any kind of a sleeve and obviate the use of a long stem? Is a TC3 necessary for uh, a, a, la a knee which is tight in uh, on the medial side? Uh, that is something that we would want to discuss. And would you use a TC3 without the stem is what is the other discussion point. So we'll start with the first one is the use of stem in a significant medial bone loss. Uh, yeah. Mr. Jahangir, sir, uh, what, what would your take be? Yeah, you, do you want me to say it now or do you want to you yes. want your yes. talk? So these three or, points, yeah. these three points we would want to learn from you. So we want your guidance. Right. Yeah, yeah, but you are you sure you want me to start or you want you all to say first? I don't mind starting. Should I kick off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can kick off, sir. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Avinash, first of all, I'm telling you, you've done a fantastic job and your clinical execution of that, we all have to agree, is excellent. Yeah, straight down the middle, you've done your augments. Yeah, you have to accept that and your alignment is there. So, please, congratulations for that. Thank now you. we'll come to the decision making for each one. And Anup, you hit it bang on the head. These are the four points I think we have to do. The first thing is if you're using any type of augment or a, let's use the word augment is a wedge or a step. Let's use that interchangeably. Aminash, is that right? That's what you use. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And let me use sleeve also as part of that. So sleeve or a augment, then we have to be obliged to use a stem, right? Let's accept that as correct standard whether you're doing a primary or a revision and within that avinash you're right if you're using metaphysical sleeves i'm not saying you have to use it in the case or not but for everyone my point was because i only use metaphysical sleeves that is why i use short stems you get my point everyone so that is okay. a point yeah, yeah okay. so there's no wrong or right you are right you are using a different method of construct in that case you have to go along correct let's accept okay. that so the length is only I'm talking about short is because metaphysical seeds have shown that their long-term survivals are better with short steps. Yeah. So that's where we are. Okay. So that is one question, Anup. The Anu, second question, Anup, was can you remind me again is the is we, the use is the use of a TC3 of yeah. the virus valve constrained knee. Yeah. Um, Necessary or not? Yeah. yeah. Indicated in a tight virus knee. So uh, the whole question that I'll I'll put it simply is. If you release the MCL completely, or if you feel that your MCL is gone, would you use a TC3, or there is a school of thought that you would shift directly to a hinge? Yeah. So now, I think even let's come down even less than that. So Avinash, the only thing I would say, I've done cases like which you've said, and I've done it a bit differently, is that okay. my decision making, and I think Anup was trying to tell you that, that please, and this is something which don't, please examine a patient thoroughly. There's no doubt we have to, but what you're seeing at that time in the clinical radiograph which you're giving me is only due to the bone loss. You cannot yeah. judge laxity at that time. Do we all agree in the house that that yeah. is the message we should all give? Please examine, please document. But in my mind, when I started, I used to get, you know, people who come with all these crazy deformities. Now it doesn't phase me at all because these deformities are due to bone loss, right? They are not due to laxity. You cannot judge that. So therefore, I keep a hinge on standby or keep whatever you want on standby. But my first primary decision making is only on getting that bone loss correct by either a metaphysical sleep or your step wedge, whatever you want, get your joint line correct. And then I judge. Now, there, Anup and Avinash, if I felt in this case, however tight you are, if when you examine the knee after that, there was no valgus varus laxity. I actually would not think that this patient needed any, any more constraint, right? Because I didn't think you needed it. But Avinash, you were there. And because something happened, the balance, you're right. It happens in real life. When that balance is not right, and I would have done it. If your balance is not right, then you need to go up in your degree of constraint, right? And then you made that decision. And if you made that decision for TC3, that's excellent. But in that case, Avinash, I'm telling you very that then if you've gone higher in constraint, 
then you are obliged to use a stem on the femoral side femoral. because you've gone high up in constraint. Okay. okay. So that decision making for the stem, which I've answered the third question, I feel you have to. So the minute any one of us goes up in constraint, a stem has to be used on either side. Yeah, both sides. Okay. If you're using the metaphysical sleeve or your step only on bone restoration, which is in your tibia, then the stem is only for the tibia side. You agree? So that's, that's how my decision making is. But I am very clear. I personally don't go up in constraint at all unless it's truly needed. So, and I feel generally the more you start doing more constraint and you do less constraint. So I'm not saying yeah. take a risk, but I would not go for a higher constraint. So I would not have felt a TC3, but if I were on the table, Avinash, like you, and it had to happen, so be it. You've done the right thing. Yeah, just Actually, from the learning, the, yeah, learning perspective, Dr. Animesh, uh, if you can tell us what was the situation on table? I think it was uh, 4 or 5 mm laterally opening out on the lateral opening side. Up. And yeah. tight, maybe. Yeah. So, was this the need to use a PC3? You may just, just leave it. What What is your opinion? Correct, correct, Anup, correct. So, uh, I was not very sure if I put a poly of even it's this poly which I have used is a 12 poly right now. That's right, yeah. yeah. Good. So, even even now, if uh, I, I had to put a, say, by some chance, 14 poly to balance the lateral side, the lateral mm -hmm. opening, uh, I was I was not sure because the bone quality was very poor. I didn't want to uh, shovel anything forcefully inside. Uh, that's why I was like, let's uh, let's do some more medial release. I did, as I said, I did pie crusting. Pie crusting yeah. yeah, and then I got some some opening medially, and then also the opening on the lateral side was too much. So I, I decided that. Can I, can I give you another point, Aminash, for the future? Yeah. yeah. Whenever um, what I saw on your X-rays, if you're in this position, I would yes. normally be downsizing on my tibial tray. And if you are downsizing, tibial tibial tray, reduction osteotomy. Yeah. Not reduction, not reduction osteotomy. osteotomy yeah. Just downsize. I felt if I saw your X-rays that you could yeah. have downsize on your tibial tray because this all this medial side pie crusting, I don't think you really need to do anything. You need to remove all osteobites. You need to no. do a, there's no real release. You just remove your osteobites, which I'm sure you've done. But then mm -hmm. if there's any medial overhang or even your tibial tray, always downsize. Yeah? Okay. And that you'll have more work to play on the bony part. So this also is, I always downsize the tibia when I'm in this various condition. Yeah. So that was there in my mind whether to do, uh, I mean, to downsize and then couple it with the femur of that particular yeah, size. Yeah, yeah. But this is, yeah. So this is the Anup. Good case, good case, yeah. Lovely. So we, but I would say the message I think for everyone is don't rely on clinical judgment. A, if you're on the table, do like Avinash has done, use whatever you want for bone restoration. And that I agree. Let's all agree whether you use a step, wedge, wires, stem it's fine you got your tibial base fit perfect your joint line was there or oh, i will use a sleeve let's use a stem always if you use that that's the third message but after that is where there'll be a little difference on what we all want to do have with this case is that at that case if there was even a small amount of mismatch right avinash i think yes. that is better to i'm not saying we accept mismatch we have to go for perfect balance but hmm. jumping to a TC3 may not be the answer. It's a big, it's a, it's a yeah. big, big yeah. jump. And the TC3 jump should be there if you truly have, like Anub was trying to say, if you truly something happened on the table and your collaterals are off, then it's a different matter, right? And then we can decide whether we go for this or a higher. But that's only if that. But for just a mismatch going for TC3, I think that is, you all agree, that may not be the right thing always. Yes, yeah? uh, I got the mess. I got the yeah, yeah. Yeah, but good. But you had to do what you had to do, and which was right. And a lovely case, lovely. Case. Okay. Right. Like, uh, let's move on to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Goyal. Dr. Goyal, can you share your screen? Yeah, can I share my screen? Please. All right. Uh, can everybody see? Uh, yeah, we yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just just give me just one minute before you start. I don't want to hear it from the start. Just one minute.
Yeah, go for that. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. Um, I have a case to discuss here. It is a 69-year-old female who visited to us in December 2018 with complaints of pain and difficulty to walk, more pain on the medial side. No signs of gross signs of infection, blood levels were within normal limits, no comorbidities. She underwent bilateral unicompartmental arthroplasty for OA in 2016. Mm -hmm. So this is the X-ray which, which she visited us. I'm sorry for the bad X-ray, and this is the closer view. Lovely. No, very I good. Could, I could say this could be the unhappy knee what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, uh, when we look at the closer picture, there's a malalignment also of the TBL and femoral component. Mm -hmm. So if you see the TBL component is in valgus, whereas the mm -hmm. femoral component is literally in extension with varus, and there is a loosening and osteolysis around the both the components. Mm -hmm. uh, here you can see around the uh, TBL plate as well as the femur also, femoral mm -hmm. component. So we decided to undertake the patient for a single stage procedure. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, implant removal, bilateral, unicondylar knee. And we used a navigation. We used B-Brown Escalab Orthopilot 5.1 version. And we did what was the patient? Is just Dr. Goel. What was the patient's complaint? Patient was having pain and difficulty to walk. Okay. Okay. That, that's the only reason. In, and she was not happy. Actually. Pain where? Pain in the where? medial side and lateral side, more in the medial side when she used to walk. Okay, okay. So the pain started, I think, mostly around six months to one year post-op, primary. The pain was in the proximal tibial area. I mean, this is quite common after UK. Where was the pain? I think. Uh, Anteromedial side, a little bit. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So yeah. then we decided to undertake the patient for a single stage. And this is the immediate post-op. So we treated it as a primary itself using a navigation one. We use a stem for the TBSI. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is six months and one year post-op follow. Two years. Mm -hmm. And now we have a three-year follow-up of her. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Nice. And if time permits, I have one more case. Uh, if you allow me, can I? Go on, go on. Yeah. Uh, any... yeah, yeah. Uh, just a quick case. And this is straightforward 81 year old female complains of pain in the left knee with swelling, difficulty to walk, hypertension, and diabetes, marked TLC elevated, raised ESR and CRP. TKR was done three years ago. This was the uh, x ray when he presented to us. Gross evidence of infection. So we decided to take a two-stage revision. First stage, removal of the primary implants with an articular spacer. And second stage, three months later, the articular spacer removal and re revision TKR. So this was the first stage with articular spacer, what we can see around here. And we used tobramycin with vancomycin. And with this, we uh, allowed full weight bearing with crutches with the brace and this was the immediate follow post-op mm -hmm. second stage mm -hmm. unfortunately I don't have a lateral view or um, successive follow-ups because of COVID the patient has not turned up now sure. that's, sure. fine. Yeah. That's, it. that's it from my side two cases yes okay. right so the, the discussion about the unhappy knee sir yeah. After a UK, uh, your 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 tips and your your thought process on the same. Yeah. Thank you, Anup uh, and Jay and uh, well, once again, uh, okay. thank you for that. Now in unis, right? And it's correct. One of the issues with unis is that we are we revising unis when they don't need to be revised. Let's accept that one. Yeah. Let's say the hip, the knee came with. I don't do many unis at all. In fact, I've stopped completely. But if there are enough surgeons to do fantastic unis, but are we going to revise a, Let's suppose this was a knee TKR. Would you revise it? What do you think? So for loosening, yes. Uh, I agree. Uh, if the pain is because of loosening, you see... No, uh, not loosening. Yeah. yeah. 
correct uh, so so here I'm, it's a different case altogether if we don't see loosening and the patient is unhappy he has got pain over the the proximal tibial region yeah. and some anterior knee pain he goes to the next door surgeon and what would your the indication be for a revision and that's, that's, that's what so, I'm, yeah and that comes down to i feel unis are getting revised more because people will unise it more while if it's a knee replacement the same problem people will keep it right so i am saying again, again that in your case dr goel yes, you revised it on the basis of the fact that you felt it was malaligned or was there loosening right you have to ask that one question which is what we should all want to know and in the unhappy knee with the uni it is a difficult decision making because a patient like you says what but tenderness and pain now it's very difficult to judge unhappy patients but if there was so in your opinion this was more malaligned rather than loosening is that correct i think Or, it was more of loosening if we could see more okay. clearly the x ray yes yes yeah but now that again was there sequential x rays done but let's accept that you did it and the patient now is happy let's accept that decision making has been done for you correctly and you got a happy patient is that right dr lewis yes yes yeah that's absolutely right yes and therefore if we can talk uh, anup about so the unhappy patients is little for unis is a bit different we can talk about unhappy patients for other things but for uni my feeling would be that we should be careful of revising unis unless there's a clear indication for it that's one just a message and once it's done i think from i'll ask jay's opinion and your opinion anup that i think doing it in this manner is correct that if you are revising uni let's all accept we'll use some degree of a stem to get that yeah because your tibial yes. proximal is not good anup and jay agree with that to a certain degree yeah. yes yes yeah so we'll use a stem so uh, siddharth but we will correct on that and yeah. we wanted to offload the correct tibial stem more was needed no constraint needed no yeah. stem on the femur side this was what is right a uh, second case is the question of articulated commercially available spacers or not my hmm. feeling is i personally don't use any of them they never fit personally very well on any 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 one's tibia hmm. what uses the best is a femur of that size and a all poly tibia is cheaper you cement it loosely with the antiparties you want to put in and it works better than a commercially available articulated spacer all right okay. and i've gone away from commercially available articulated spacers they are too expensive they don't work their while because you have small medium large and that's what it is if you're custom true. making one then it's more for palava so i do this i don't know what all the other five of custom made custom made spacers probably end up working as static spacers at the end of the day You know, yeah. you don't they articulate well, so then you might as well put in a space of block and get out. Yeah. But yeah, I do. I do what uh, what you explain. You know, for my uh, first stage revisions, where I would probably use a femur or poly tibia, and leave the patient in for more than two or three months before you know I take a call on revision. And I'm happy. Yeah. I I I usually use the commercially available ones. Mm-hmm. uh because for once that if the patient decides to postpone his surgery for whatever reason maybe reinfection uh, mm-hmm. patient is not willing for surgery i think it gives a, a better chance for them to articulate nothing against uh, using static spacers but static spacers really put the patient in bed that's what i no, believe no, i know we are talking about a, we are talking about a proper <laughs> femur cement yeah, implant yeah that yeah. loosely cemented so it's a complete it's a complete knee where you're actually using that patient size so the articulation are commercially available or putting in a femur which is cemented and a all poly the what yeah. i agree with you anup is this cheeseburger like just a static i agree with you that is you know keeping the patient in bed because they are taking no walk so that true no yeah. but, but i, I would just guide you that try this yes yes i i i take your point sir yeah yeah so i mean probably use a static spacer only if there's a lot of bone loss or you know yeah. have got cross ligament issues mm-hmm. you know i just want the patient not walk on that leg at all and just let the infection yeah. go first then probably so, correct i would add one more point to that i do it always if there's any sinus so any sinus no articulated spacer okay so that but again the people who believe in one stage it there but if you're a practical surgeon taking on cases you want the best results you know you've not done 100 200 yet 
you know, of revision only for infection, then you may as well do it in a safe manner, which is, like you said, art, non-articulated space, uh, let the sign is healed, go in and what in your hands uh, gives gives a happy outcome to patients in your needs? What one technical point or uh, post-operative protocol gives in, gives the the happy feel to the patient? In the revision, everything perfect. In a revision mm-hmm. or a primary? I would and say if you really ask, is truly looking after the patient from the time the patient comes to you in the hospital, yeah, every part of the patient's journey and complete access to you at all times, especially when they have a problem. And our problem everywhere in the world as surgeons is that when the patient has a little bit of issue, we tend not to want to see that patient, right? Or the patient doesn't want to see you and go somewhere else. You should be, and I've done it now, it's very clear. I look after that patient more. So any patient who has a problem, unhappy, he can come every two weeks to the clinic. In the end, they get so unhappy, that doctor, I don't want to come, you make him come. And that is where you, I think we all over the world, we should do. And then that patient becomes yours. And that is the best tip to tell all of you. Don't run away from that patient who is unhappy. Keep him as your friend. I'm telling you, do it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Good. Actually, we move on here, I would like, uh, here yeah. I would like to add one more point. Uh, hmm. Yeah. That... Working in England, I, I got this message that communication is very is is the key to be connected with the patient. Because here in India, our training revolves mostly around the theory, mostly around the surgical part of uh, orthopedic training, mm-hmm. and we lack communication skills. We mm-hmm. lack uh, how to how to gain confidence of the patient. Yeah, yeah. And this this I was I got multiple feedback while working in England. Uh, about the communication skills. Yeah. I, I mean, not that uh, yeah. they, they wanted to be mean or anything. They were yeah, yeah. I get your point. Negative yeah. about it, but they, yeah. it helped me. It helped me a lot. And yeah. this is, I, I, I tell to my juniors that uh, you should be connected to the patient. Keep on talking to them. There is no yeah. point, as but, very rightly said by... Uh-huh. Mr. Mahalakshmi, uh, there is yeah. no point sh- uh, running away from the patient. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just put the light on, uh, two minutes. Uh, just wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, last, last case. Yeah. Pardon me? One of the things that I have seen in uh, doing primaries, especially, is uh, handling the soft tissues very carefully. Because the bony parts and, you know, putting in the joint is pretty much standard world over and assuming you're doing a good, decent job over there, that doesn't cause the patient problems. It's usually the soft tissue handling, you know, patients complain of pain around the hamstrings, sometimes the patella tendon, you know, the teeth and, you know, for the first one or two months when they have that pain, that kind of stays with them for much longer than you would want it. They, you know, want, just want to crib about it. See the x-ray, they're absolutely fine, but good movement. You know it's not the joint, it's the soft tissue. So this yeah. is something that I've uh, started doing much more. You know, taking a lot of care of the soft tissue, the section, uh, making it clean, not making it too messy, so that it heals better. And yeah. hoping that another that thing which is yeah, sorry to interrupt, Jack. Another thing which is important is counseling of the patient before going for the primary total knee or revision total knee. If we can tell them that what to expect in the first week, what to expect in the third week from the, the from the surgery, then it it uh, it helps them a lot. Because a patient oh, is a non non technical person. He is non orthopedic. He doesn't know how much pain to experience. And uh, what all things to experience. So this counseling prior to the surgery, prior to either the revision or the primary total knee surgery is very crucial. Correct. Uh, Anup, any points, Anup? And you, do, you, do you do anything? you agree with these or do you have anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, it's like uh, the real success in life is mm-hmm. closing the gap between uh, expectation and reality. Yeah. I yeah. guess... Uh, Having the expectation feeling high and uh, having a reality on your hand are two different things, I guess. Feeling that gap is more important at the end of the day because over a period of time, most of the surgeons are doing a pretty better job than me as well. 
Yeah. I'm very sure of that, but I guess that's what the cause of the difference. Yeah. Good point. Let's let's move on to the last case, Dr. Uh, Agarwal. Yes, sir. Uh, the case which I was going to present uh, is uh, more or less already been discussed. Just uh, I'll put the case on. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's better it's, even if we repeat the same concepts. That's better in things like this. So everything in that. Uh, Somehow I see revision case patients are are much happier than primaries. Correct. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. I see yeah, that, that, that's why we are, we are we are we really are very thankful to yeah. the patients. The ones who have the revision, you know, much much sooner after the primary, they have actually had such a bad experience in the primary. Yeah. If they have a decent revision, you know, they just more than thankful for it because the pain yeah. goes high. So and expectation is toned down for those patients. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Goyal, yes, know, sir. just while uh, Rakesh is putting up his x-rays, you know, the uh, when you show the infection second stage, it looked very nice, perfect alignment, but your polyliner would have been about 18? Uh, 16. 16, 16 yeah. yeah. So yeah. therefore, just for the future, for the because we are all, this part of it is getting the next case better, Yes. Aim that you should have used the augments to distalize. Probably that went a little, you know, either your first block was there or your two four went a little. So you should could have distalized that to have four millimeters more, and that would have been a perfect twelve point five, which is exactly what you want. Okay, so I could have distalized the joint line also. Yes, because whenever you are sixteen, just for next time, just tell yourself, yeah. could I have distalized? Taking, but yeah. then how are you going to execute that is the tips I was trying to say. Yes, yes, keep yes. that window, whichever system you're using is just more. Go back, you know, it's a thinking process of, of how much you're going to put your organs. Yeah. Take it. Take don't it. shy away. Even if there's little bone distal, you don't have to have good distal bone. I think all of us, when we start, we are worried that the distal bone is not good. Then we go back more and cut, right? Your mind tells you, oh, it's mm -hmm. not right. As I become more experienced, I've just accepted good distal bone, even if it's not the huge amount. You, you get my point. Even the small yeah, amount is what you accept as distalization more than going back, back, back to get the best bone. You agree? Uh, that's yeah, what agree. You, yeah, that feeling is there. Good. We want some more, some more bone. So we yeah, we want, you go that. And the same thing possibly. That, that, so I think this is the best tip I'll tell you. Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Also, I'm not able to. Uh, uh, just share your screen and share your screen, your desktop, uh, that another window will open up. You can just click again. Share no, your I'm, desktop. Uh, I open uh, yeah, so no, you need to go back to your Zoom window. Yeah. You'll have uh, share screen written on the bottom ribbon of your screen on the Zoom app or the Zoom. Zoom uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to do that. Yeah, you'll see, you can see share screen. On your on the bottom of your window, it's a green color button. Yeah, I've done it. I'm trying to yeah. do that. Right. Does it take you to your desktop? Does it take you to your desktop? Okay, just so. Uh, uh, I have opened it and uh, sharing the screen, but it's not going over there. You can click again on, on uh, the desktop icon. Okay. Let me cancel it. Okay. So, cemented stems, uncemented stems, your idea, Mr. Mahalashmi Wala. Yeah, I would say my view on the tibial side is very clear. The tibial side is very clear because, yeah. as I said, 100%, Anup, you asked a very Dr. Anup, you asked a very valid question. Do I use sleeves? What is the percentage? 100%. So when I use metavision sleeves in the revision setting, the stem will have to be used. Now that stem, I don't know complicated, but just to let you, when I work on the tibia, you know, when I'm doing my reaming, you know, when I'm going down, yeah. I reaming, yeah. the marking which I use to how far I go down tells me that I use, I go down for the marking for an uncemented 75 centimeter. Okay? That's yeah, it, 75. Yeah. So seven millimeters is what I go down to. 
Then I do all my work. So I, you know, use the first reamer, the power reamer, then my uh, the sleeve with that attached. Yeah, 75. That's and when it. I finally implant, when I finally implant on the tibial side, I just put cement only on the bone surface on the proximal tibia and a little That's bit on the base plate, but none near the vicinity of the metabasal sleeve and definitely not, not down the stem. But, That's yeah, but I change my uncemented 75 to a 30 or a 60 cemented stem, right? Okay, okay. But, so the stem is called cemented stem because it's shorter, right, Anu? But mm, it's not yeah. cemented. You get my point? That's right, yeah. yeah. I just want a short cemented stem, but it's, it's called cemented because the implant company makes it 60 only or 30 as a cemented variety, but I don't cement it in, correct? On That's the right. femoral side, if, again, Anup, you put a very good point. You agree that if your metavisual, I mean, if your diaphysial fit is very nice, you know, you read nicely, 12, 13, you've got it nice. Then I do tend to go for an uncemented press fit short, always 75, never long, never long on my femur, right? But yes. if I know that a femur is so big and it's short, you're never going to get a true press fit. You agree with that? You know, you're, you can't convince okay. you to get a good fit. In that case, again, I do my work on a 75 uncemented, right? But when yes. I finally come to implant, I ask for a 60 millimeter cemented step. Cemented, right? Yeah. And That's that right. one, I don't mind putting some cement, cement in the metaphysical area. So it's not that I shove everything up the whole canal, but at least the metaphysical part of it, I don't shy away from cement. Because you're not using the sleeve over there. Yeah, yeah, that's provided when you sleep. If I use sleep, forget about then it. There's no then, yeah, then there's no cement. Happy with that answer, Anu? Yes, sir, yes, yes. Do you all use the same? Do you and all of you Is that the five of you all will consider the same or you all don't? But do what I'm saying because it makes a yeah. difference. It's I guess we don't, we don't use sleeves that often, I guess. That, that's, no, uh, sleeves uh, forget about on the femoral side. Yeah. I'm saying femoral side. Yeah. Where they use. Short, short, stubby, cemented stems on the femoral side. Fantastic. So we all agree yeah. that's the message. Yes. Let's all accept that as a message from all of yeah. us. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I guess Dr. Rakesh, you can go on. Yeah. yeah. Is it there? Yeah, Rakesh. Yeah, 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 it's it's very good. Yeah. Is it visible? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm yes, not able to. Go on. No, we click it again. Just click on it again. Click on it again. It'll move. Yeah. Uh, put your mouse and click anywhere. It'll start moving. <laughs> I'm not able to see it. Ah, uh, you you will not be. Hmm. Okay. Here? Yeah. Am yeah. I am I visible? Slide show. Yes. Yes. Slide show. Okay, fine. Rakesh slide show. Yeah. 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 Is it okay now? Yeah, it can. We can see you. Uh, so this is uh, this was a 70 year old male. Uh, he presented to us uh, uh, me in 2014 actually. Uh, mm -hmm. he was uh, having fracture neck femur in the opposite side. Mm -hmm. So he was happy with the surgery of the hip. So he wanted to get his left limb operated for, to improve his gait. So this was the thing. And this was the gait post uh, surgery of the right hip. And he wanted uh, improvement upon it. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time, I wasn't that wise uh, for knee replacements, and uh, uh, I went ahead with the uh, grafting of the middle defect. Uh, balancing was good enough. The brackish is been moving ahead. Uh, can we yeah. can earlier? Uh... Can you go on to your PPT and and just click next? Is it okay? Oh, uh, but slide show. on the second slide. Second slide. Okay. This one. Now, yeah. Now it's better. It's moving. Now the next. Now the next slide. Yeah. Of the gate. Next, yeah. Okay. Next yeah. slide. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's right. Great, yeah. All right. So next. Okay. 
so this was the entrop and i have put the graft in the defect mm -hmm. i didn't use the stem which should i have i should have used mm -hmm. and uh, this was a planning mm -hmm. and uh, the balancing was good yeah this was the immediate immediate post op x ray yeah beautiful and uh, this was the right hip yeah this is uh, almost 3 uh, months uh, i hope so because i don't have any further x rays uh, so still i could see what i could make out here there was some sort of uh, graft subsidence mm -hmm. but still no loosening was there yeah yeah can we see that this yes, graft yes. is trying to unite but uh, there is subsidence a bit of subsidence correct yeah yeah this was the gate it was a very low demand patient actually at that time yeah yeah he was pretty happy with the outcome sure i'm sure uh, uh, uh how much uh, the graft has uh, subsided i don't know actually correct yeah uh, yeah no i guess a good point to discuss now once we have a defect and we lateralize the tibia uh, not in all cases can we put in a, a long rod i mean would we have uh, the opinion of the house for that i guess you've done a wonderful job i don't think uh, this would have required a stem yeah 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 so, so what is, is your... so yeah we we are lateralizing then probably we'll have to use a eccentric stem <coughs> yeah so mm, so that, so should i uh, ano should i mention yeah. yes 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 we waiting for your so, comment so the rakesh first of all fantastic alignment i mean we all have to agree here yeah, it's beautiful you got your tibial plate perfect yeah, i should say sir i don't do much of uh, knee surgeries uh, and uh, in way, this was way back in 2014 okay. i dug up this case especially yeah. for this uh, forum yeah, yeah. so one is very good and we all agreed on that there is no doubt second decision making i mean i just want to clarify for the house as well as for everyone listening that the indication for doing a knee replacement should not be gate only i'm sure he had pain is that correct on yeah definitely he had pain definitely he had pain and uh, yeah uh, so i would say that always in my mind now i've stopped and this is where we come down to patient expectations and everything i tell everyone categorically there's only one indication for me in for doing a knee replacement in the world and i think that's the answer is only pain everything else i'll improve as a secondary benefit so all i'm giving you a little advice to right just say that pain fitting the criteria but significant deformity you know so when patient comes with telling me for gait i'll be very clear i'm doing it for pain i don't know what will happen to your gait yeah just to a point because like you say these low demand patients they are not going to walk any better except he'll walk a little straighter yeah so just keep that in mind as a learning you agree with everyone that let us be coming down to all the points we are making is narrowing the expectation and real so that that's we agree weight bearing pain he had dr rakesh and he had uh, you done a he needed it to be done now the decision making for me would be i'm telling you again using a graft and your screws or this is fine it's a very accepted uh, way of doing it uh would there be resorption you'll have to lateralize you agree anup and jay you'll have to lateralize yes, yes. and if you lateralize and we are working on the principle that your proximal tibial base plate is suspect in the first place right that's the reason we used a graft in that case we are keeping to principles we should be using a stem let's all agree on that so the only way that could be done is a offset tray where you have a little offset where the tray where your i've done it where your actually your length your stem is going down So it's a longer stem with offset tray. That's one way of getting out with it. But technically, it's also difficult. You truly have to be in the middle of the tibia to come down. Correct? Yeah, we agree with that. But that's one way. I would still say that you can use a instead of that, you can use a stem and a step, or you know, to if you want with a with a stem. And I would have gone one further, and I will use a sleeve. Yeah, if I had to. If so I was what? Covered. What? What if uh, your your tray is pretty much covered? Once mm -hmm. you have lateralized and downsized, mm -hmm. would you still use a stem 
in every case no not if that's right not at all yes. i would only if 25 even if 15% is uncovered 20% i have not bothered at all so this okay. is where i'm saying you come down in size on a very good point fantastic point you come down in point you lateralized you have 20% of suspect won't accept it there's no need of anything more is that what you're asking no, no, yeah if the, if the if the keel is centered and uh, the edges are pretty much contained you know apart from maybe 10% of your tray which is uncovered postro medially absolutely accept it you don't need a stem yes but in this case we have to ask you know we probably yeah. was more than that right you know? yeah it was it was uncovered yeah it may be maybe but uh, i think dr rakesh if you had what you had done probably you're right anyway it was like i think anup and jn we are saying is that if you had done it so well you had downsized and lateralized you probably had reasonable good coverage of any way virgin bone yeah, that's the question we ask you yeah it had a very good coverage and oh, uh, i was bone. pretty this was very well balanced knee at that time yeah. but yeah lovely lovely case uh, just a quick question if the defect is small so when we use a cement can that be uh, taken care of it Cement. yeah so, yeah my decision making for that is cyst which you correct out you decide again ask yourself how much is is it truly coming in the way is it only on the periphery or is it in the part of your base plate ask yourself one second is that if there's any doubt you can fill up with two ways you can either fill up with cement which is 90% i do or you take bone graft from any of your cut bone ends and shove the bone graft in more size and put it in and then the third question you ask yourself is it large enough that you are so worried that you need a stem that's the only three question yeah and you, most yeah, of the time yeah. you won't need it and just accept that small defect that you filled it with cement yeah and you uh, can we do a short stem additionally on that so it can offload in case of right. when i say short stem i'm talking about the shortest stem is needed for these yeah for these small okay. but even that decision making is it a overkill or not there's no correct answer That's but right. if you want to always err on the side of caution and do what is correct principle then we all as the house agreed that this is the correct principle yeah uh, one question from to mr malakshmi wala can mesh and bone graft morselized bone graft be an option for your uh, metaphyseal bone loss the answer is that before the sleeves you can use it but nowadays please accept that you have a armamentarian which is so good and the price of morselized bone graft will come to exactly the same so therefore for that i would not agree for using any more mesh and morselized bone graft material sleeve has to be the answer what do anup and jay do you agree with that yeah and, uh, i agree yeah. yeah. i step no way second that Mm. So on table, when, what, what would make you change from a TC three to a hinge? If you're going for a TC three, what, what has to go wrong on table for you to move to a hinge? Touch wood. I try to make that decision early on. Early on, yeah, yeah, and that would be on significant bone loss already seen. Yeah, a bit like that case. Let's say we didn't want to use a DFR. you could actually get away with just the biggest of the hinges could probably you know or some way that let's say it was more distal to that okay. then you would, i would have made that decision early on in my hands by the time i remove my femur i will not be able to salvage much bolt so therefore i will be for hinge so when you have such bolt loss your collaterals are already integrity is nowhere there that decision you made early on correct you made your decision early on on supracondylar fractures where you will use a distal femoral which is a hinge anyway right so that's decision is made i made my decision very early on on any degree of anterior posterior problems yeah so the minute there is anterior problem i said i'm going to use a hinge so therefore when it truly comes to the revision the remaining amount unless something dramatically has gone wrong on the table which means i mean i truly have cut something crazily i have never changed yeah but so this is where i am and but i am the opposite for primaries in primaries i will not be going up to tc3 at all unless there is a real need you know but i mean i'm very that my constraint will never go up because there is really no need of going up constraint unless i have again cut the collateral or something which hopefully doesn't happen so the answer to that j is not common at all to make that decision on the table 
I would like to plan it earlier. Okay. Right. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, any more questions for Mr. Martin Mala from uh, the panelists? Hello. No, I think uh, I really had some oh, sir. For uh, has given a lot of his time uh, on a Thursday evening uh, back in the UK. So thank you very much for that, Mr. Martin Mala. Not at all. Would you hope you found it clear? I hope the concepts were not, I mean, a, a straightforward, clear concept. That's, I think, whether you do complex surgery or not, concepts have to be straightforward. Otherwise, if you have complex surgery and complex thought process, you'll never get it right. That's the way I look at it. Right. Thank you so much uh, for spending this time with us. Uh, learned a lot and hopefully we'll be able to carry all this back to the theaters, you know, when we, when we get our next revision. Lovely. And fantastic cases. I'm really impressed and fantastic knowledge base for everyone. Thank you, Anup. Thank you, Jay. And Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank, Thank you for having Thank spent you. so much time. Thank you, Dr. Goyal and Dr. Agrawal also for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, presenters. Very, very nice discussion. All right. Thank so you. Good. I think we call it a day. Thank you so Love. much. Not at all. Good. Lovely time. Thank bye you. Bye. Appreciate the time, sir. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah, are we offline? I don't know whether she's offline or not. I think Puna is still there. Yeah, I think she's. I hope she's. Yeah, I think we are still live on live streaming. Correct. And it's just me and Auto TV. Okay, good. See you. Good job. Bye. See you. See you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.